Hello, wonderful audience. Thank you for choosing to spend your time with me. Welcome to another exciting video where we'll be shedding light on Luis Kuttner. Luis Kuttner, June 9, 1908, March 1, 1993 was a U.S. human rights activist, FBI informant, and lawyer who was on the National Advisory Council of the U.S. branch of Amnesty International during its early years and created the concept of a living wall. He was also notable for his advocacy of world habeas corpus, the development of an international writ of habeas corpus to protect individual human rights. He was a founder of World Habeas Corpus, an organization created to fight for international policies which would protect individuals against unwarranted imprisonment. Kuttner's papers are at the Hoover Institution Archives at Stanford University. Moving on to the next segment, we have biography. Luis Kuttner was born in Chicago to Jewish-Russian immigrants. At the age of 15, he entered the law school of the University of Chicago. During the late years, Kuttner built up his reputation as a human rights lawyer. During his career he also gained the release of over 1,000 people, mainly as they were wrongfully convicted or being held without charge. Kuttner gained national recognition in 1949, when he obtained freedom for a black mechanic from Waukegan, Illinois, James Montgomery, who had served 26 years of a life-term sentence for raping an itinerant. A federal judge described as a sham the defendant's 1924 trial in which a vengeful prosecutor withheld vital evidence. He also helped free Hungarian Cardinal Jesef Minchenti, American fascist poet Ezra Pound, former Congo President Moise Somb and represented the Dalai Lama and Tibet. Kuna is widely known as one of the most prominent human rights attorneys of the 20th century. He is also accredited for the first acknowledged federal lawsuit against a prison warden by inmates in 1949. In 1952, Kuttner filed a lawsuit on behalf of a black passenger against Illinois Greyhound Lines, four years prior to the federal Montgomery bus lawsuit Brava v. Gale. In 1966, Kuttner participated in a lawsuit against George Lincoln Rockwell and the American Nazi Party. In the next segment, we'll be exploring intelligence service and its implications for our subject matter. Declassified records show that Kuttner had a history of collusion with the FBI and the CIA. In 1969, he reported Fred Hampton to the FBI in the days leading to Hampton's death at the hands of the Chicago police. In 1973, he petitioned the CIA for Irk to set up an NGO in Beijing in return letting the agency staff it completely with our own people. Let's now shift gears and explore biographical chronology through a critical lens, uncovering its strengths and weaknesses. 1927 JD, University of Chicago Law School 1930 admitted to Bar, State of Illinois 1944 offer, the Admiral Biography of George Dewey with Lauren Healy 1948 offer, Fights and Cascades. Moon Splashed, Red Wine and Shadows Poems 1953 Author, Live in 12 Minutes Novel with W.T. Brannan 1957 Author, The International Court of Habeas Corpus and the United Nations Writ of Habeas Corpus 1958 Author, World Habeas Corpus, A Proposal for International Court of Habeas Corpus and the United Nations Writ of Habeas Corpus 1961 Co-Founded Amnesty International with Peter Benenson 1962 Author, World Habeas Corpus 1966 Author, I, The Lawyer 1967 Wrote the First Living Will 1970 Author, Legal Aspects of Charitable Trusts and Foundations, A Guide for Philanthropoids, The Intelligent Women's Guide to Future Security, also published as How to Be a Wise Widow 1970 Editor, The Human Right to Individual Freedom, a Symposium on World Habeast Corpus 1972 U.S. Congressional Nominee for the Nobel Peace Prize 1974 Offer, Due Process of Rebellion, How to Be a Wise Widow, and The Trial of William Shakespeare 3 Act Play. In the upcoming section, we'll be dissecting Author of Living Wool and exploring its implications in greater detail. Louis Kuttner was the first to publish the concept of the living will which is the oldest form of an advanced directive in 1969. 
The term living will means that this form of will was to be used while an individual was still alive but no longer able to make decisions. The term first occurs in the Luis Kovner papers in a letter of November 15, 1967, in the context of Kuttner's correspondence with the Euthanasia Society of America. Kuttner had first addressed the Euthanasia Society in August 1967 in connection with his plans to prepare an international symposium on euthanasia pro and con which however was never materialized. On December 7, 1967, Kuttner held a speech on euthanasia and due process of law at the Euthanasia Society's annual meeting in New York City. By that time, Kuttner's paper Due Process of Euthanasia, The Living Will, a proposal was ready to be published, but publication was delayed until summer 1969 due to difficulties to find a publisher. In this paper, Kuttner showed some sympathy with the propagators of death on request active euthanasia, but stressed that a living will authorizing mercy killing would be contrary to public policy. Subsequently, Kuttner published four more articles about the topic, in which he followed the same line of argumentation. For example, in 1987 he wrote in the University of Detroit Law Review, the living will is a means for the individual to manage his death by protective guidelines and is premised on the informed consent of the person prior to an irreversible coma or a state of being disabled or maimed. It is based on the right of privacy the individual's right to self-determination of his body. The Euthanasia Society of America adopted Kutner's idea and devised a living will document which was distributed among members by the affiliate charity society Euthanasia Educational Fund which became Euthanasia Educational Council in 1972 and Concern for Dying in 1978. Kutner probably never became a member of the Euthanasia Society of America or one of its successor organizations, and his later attempts to cooperate with them failed. Get ready for an exciting exploration as we unravel the mysteries of Gary Davis' case. When the French government indicted world citizen Gary Davis on June 8, 1971 for issuing the world passport from his home in Hessinque, Hort Rhin, he engaged Dr. Louis Kuttner as counsel during the trial at Mulhouse, H.R. Following the trial, on June 10, 1971, Davis called a General Assembly of Delegates of the World Government of World Citizens at Novsel, Sosheim, H.R. to declare the founding of the World Court of Human Rights, based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Articles 6-11. He appointed Louise Kuttner as Chief Justice. See Kuttner's acceptance speech below. Kuttner's commission subsequently wrote the statute for the Court for Due Process of International Law. A test of the new court's efficacy was demonstrated in the case of Dennis Cecil Hills, the British author, residing in Uganda during Eddie Ammon's presidency, who was scheduled to die by firing squad on June 26, 1975, for having written of the president as a village tyrant and therefore subsequently condemned as an enemy of the state. On Friday, June 23, Davis from Strasbourg, France sent the following telegram to Chief Justice Kuttner in Chicago. I-N-T-H-E-N-A-N-E-O-F-T-H-E-C-O-O-R-D-I-N-A-T-I-N-G-C-O-M-M-I-T-T-E-O-F-W-O-R-L-D-G-O-V-R-N-M-E-N-T-
Mr. Samsa Buga, legal advisor of the Charged Affairs of the Uganda Embassy in Washington, informed Kutner on Monday, June 26, of the reception of the telegraphed writ, was willing to comply and wished to negotiate Dennis Hill's release. Kutner informed the legal advisor the matter was strictly judicial, not diplomatic, and that, if the defendant was not released forthwith, this court will issue a show cause order to which the president will have 30 days to reply. At 5 p.m., Uganda time, Cecil Hill was released from detention. On July 27, 2011, the World Court of Human Rights was declared de jurist by world citizen Gary Davis from the War Memorial Opera House from where the United Nations was declared over 66 years prior. Dr. Louise Kuttner's acceptance speech as the Chief Justice of the World Court of Human Rights. I am indeed honoured by this appointment which I accept in all humility. The international community has come to realise that human rights are not an issue to be left solely to the national jurisdiction of individual states. These rights obviously need protection at a higher level within the framework of international law. If the principal aim of society is to protect individuals in the enjoyment of what Blackstone termed absolute rights, then it follows that the aim of human laws should serve to promote and guard these rights. As the world coordinator rightly pointed out, this morning's trial dramatically exposed the dilemma faced by the sovereign state. While advocating human rights and even proclaiming them as a common standard of achievement, as does the preamble to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it prosecutes blindly as the spokesman for the French government so vividly revealed a stateless person who, to provide a legitimate framework for his own rights, was obliged to found his own government. I wholly support this action as a logical corollary of the UN's proclamation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. If we accept the legitimacy of individual choice in political matters which is, after all, the essence of democracy then the legitimacy of a world government chosen by millions of ordinary citizens cannot be in doubt. What began as a declaration of intent on December 10, 1948 has been slowly evolving into a global compact, a set of rules that prescribe and prescribe the behaviour of governments toward their citizens. There exists today a codified body of international human rights laws that include conventions and covenants on genocide, civil and political, economic and social rights, refugees and women's rights and racial discrimination. The international community is currently working on instruments to prevent torture, to protect the rights of children and to assure the freedom of religion. While these instruments are not self-enforcing, they do provide means for holding governments accountable. They lead inevitably to this assembly today. We are the citizens concerned. We are the ultimate arbiters of human rights as they are innate and inalienable. Our action today in founding a new court to which the single world citizen can appeal falls within the historical evolution of law itself as an evolving institution. After all, the standards and norms enumerated and outlined in international human rights instruments have not been imposed on any of the nations that are party to them. They are, instead, obligations that governments, having assumed freely and voluntarily, cannot afford to abrogate or disregard under any pretext. The World Court of Human Rights, while not operating under any written world constitution, nonetheless can embody a world bill of rights which defines guarantees relating to deprivation of life, inhumane treatment, slavery and forced labour, personal liberty, determination of rights, including procedural safeguards in criminal cases, freedom of conscience, expression, peaceable assembly and movement, freedom from discrimination and prohibition against compulsory acquisition of property without adequate compensation. Indeed the very enunciation and acceptance of these basic human rights implies due process to ensure their implementation and punishment to their violators. Such was the premise of the Nuremberg Court. No written world constitution sanctioned the Nuremberg principles. Yet they were effectively used by the Allies to charge, convict and condemn those accused of the international crimes of war planning, war making and genocide. Before this assembly, I pledge my best and most devoted endeavours as Chief Justice of the World Court of Human Rights in the service of the oppressed, the persecuted and the downtrodden.
it has been said that the guarantees of personal liberty and impartial justice are the first casualties of a so-called national emergency. Civil courts are too often replaced by military tribunals and the writ of habeas corpus is usually suspended. Inevitably, the despicable use of preventive detention replaces the constitutional guarantees of personal liberty. The citizenry then is made to live in a perpetual state of emergency. When that happens, the state becomes an end in itself, a mere summation of the individuals within it. The world government of world citizens that you here represent is the only effective counterbalance to national citizenry becoming national servitude due to suppression of civil liberties in the name of national security and public order. Now the newly declared World Court of Human Rights will take its place as a needful addition to provide a legal refuge. A global asylum, as it were, to our fellow citizens everywhere. I profoundly believe this day's work has the blessings of the Almighty. Thank you. Now, let's delve into the intricacies of notes and references and explore its various aspects. Kakari Births, Kakari Deaths, Kakari Lawyers from Chicago, Kakari University of Chicago Law School, Lalamai Kakari F. Century American Lawyers, Kakari Federal Bureau of Investigation Informants. Thanks for being a part of this amazing journey. I can't wait to bring you more exciting content.